have quite a few people joining now. We'll get started. Uh, welcome to our webinar on CMMC 2.0, uh, 2 Mythbusters. You guys are going to have some questions, I'm sure, at the end of this. If you can just go, go ahead and hold your questions to the end, we'll have a, uh, a, a brief Q&A at the, at the very end of the presentation. My name is Eric Pinto. I am uh, run the channel team here at Stock Sauter. I've been in the MSP uh, community for quite some time now. Uh, I sit on the advisory board for CompTIA Cybersecurity and also on the DE&I advisory board at, at Channel Partners. Proud to have uh, one of our team, a member of our team, Melissa Kaiser here. She's our director of compliance uh, with 20 plus years in the U.S. Army as well as the U.S. Air Force Cyber Warfare Officer. Uh, she's worked for GE Aviation, and that's, uh, that's incredibly important here because, as you guys know, GE Aviation, along with other manufacturers, really is at, is at the heart of, of, uh, of some of the concerns here with CMMC uh, and the driving force. Uh, Melissa is a registered practitioner uh, and CCCP uh, candidate for CMMC. All right. Thanks uh, for the introduction. Okay. Thanks for the introduction, Eric. Um, happy to be here. I, I don't know if it's a sign, but it, we have a thunderstorm going on right now. So I, I don't know what that means, if, if it means anything. But um, but yeah, I've been doing um, this whole thing since it came out in 2016. I'm reading the regulation pretty much daily. So it's hard. It's it's really hard. If you haven't really dug into CMMC. Um, it's, uh, it's quite challenging. I think it's probably one of the hardest regulations that you can, you can, uh, learn, which could be a good thing because then it makes all the other regulations a lot easier to understand. Um, yeah, as Eric says, I've been, I've been in the military for 20 plus years. I've been on the, uh, like an assessor and I've been an assessee and everything I've heard about how the certification is going to happen. It's it's really no surprise to me. And what I hope to do is I hope to impart some knowledge for you so you can go back to your customers and just stay one page ahead of them in the CMMC playbook. Um, I'm gonna give it to you from more of an MSP perspective, what things I'm seeing that the MSP community is doing by me doing gap assessments, poems, writing, um, you know, SSPs and just trying to educate you and the, the DIB, the defense industrial base to know what this is supposed to be doing um, and how you're supposed to be doing it. Oh, okay. So, um, so CMMC is 25% technology and 75% documentation. Um, th and that's why it's so hard is this documentation piece. You implement the technology, you select the technology, then you have to make sure the technology is configured correctly. And then once you do that, you got to write about it. So you got your policies and then you got to write your procedures on how you manage the technology and the people who are using it. And that's where the difficult part is because that is that that small businesses and MSPs, you guys aren't geared to write this type of stuff. It's hundreds of pages. Um, we can help here to, to uh, make this a lot less complicated and eat this elephant one bite at a time. Um, one of the things that you have to think about with CMMC, the first thing to do to really get started is to know the CUI, which is Controlled Unclassified Information. And at the end of this webinar, which you will get notes from, um, you'll get this webinar to you. I have a lot of references, so you can go ahead and look at the references and you know understand them a little bit better. They're the references that I use most of the time. I'm always in the references, and they're not marketing documents. They're from the actual government. Um, so CUI, you need to look at at CUI through that lens, who has access to it, where does it live, and how does, how does it get transmitted? Once you can answer those questions, this whole process in CMMC will be a lot easier for you. But that's the million dollar question. A lot of times 
your customers and you don't know where the CUI lives and who has access to it or anything like that. Um, and that's the million dollar question. Once you have that answered, this thing will be a lot easier for you. Um, so getting into it, like I said, I was, I was involved in it or been knowing about it since 2016. And 2016, they said the DOD told all the DIB, the defense industrial base, all those DOD contractors say, hey, you need to do a self-assessment against NIST 800-171 and you need to be compliant with that. And so everybody in the DIB looked at it, opened the first, read the first page and closed the book and said, yep, I'm good, we're, we're certified. Um, and the DOD you know, caught on to that, that everybody was lying to, about it. And then they released in January of 2020, CMMC 1.0. And this is where everybody got scared. So what this meant is that because everybody was lying, they required all, all everybody in the DIB to get certified against CMMC by third party assessors. So these would be specially trained assessors to go in and make sure that everybody is certified or is compliant. Um, and they did it against five maturity models. So level one through five. Level one was the basic, it had 17 controls. Then you had level two where they weren't going to assess anybody against level two. And then you had level three, which is 130 controls. Uh, back in 2016, they said you need to be um, certified against NIST 800-171, which only had 110 controls. So they added 20 additional controls to level three. And level three is really where your CUI starts. At level one, you have FCI. At level three, you have CUI. Um, and I'll talk about the, the difference of the 20, which um, we're saying the industry is saying is called the Delta 20. And then level four and five had 171 controls. Um, and nobody really talked about that because nobody really knew much about it. And they also said, which was a big one, is that there was no POAMs allowed, no plan of action and milestones. You must be certified to 100% of all the controls. Um, and they found that was going to be really, really hard because you had the DIBCAC, which is the, the DOD's arm, to come out and assess those third-party assessors, the C3PAOs. C3 um, and there was probably, they did about, I can't remember, like 60 assessments and only three passed. And the DOD went back and was like, oh, we have a problem. Uh, because these C3PAOs are cybersecurity people. They're cybersecurity companies with compliance on staff. And they should be, that should be easy, but it obviously wasn't. Um, you can see on some of the badges, we are a C3PAO candidate. We have to get inspected by the, the DIBCAC in order to become official. So we've gotten past the first step. Anyway, so they noticed that there was a lot of problems with the cybersecurity companies passing. So the DOD came out with CMMC 2.0 of November of 2021. And initially there was a lot of confusion, um, but it became a little bit easier um, for everybody, including small businesses. So they went from five levels to three, um, where you have level one is seven, still the 17 controls. And that is people who have FCI, so federal contract information. That's basically the contract that the government gives you. And that's gonna be a self attestation. So self-attestation means that the CEO or president has to say, yes, we are compliant with these 17 controls. So before it could have been salespeople, you know, people not really responsible. Um, so they want somebody who's in charge to take responsibility of it because if they're not, if they're lying about it, you know, you could get in trouble and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, level two went back to NIST 800-171 with 110 controls. So they dropped the, the, the Delta 20. Um, and further guidance came out and says, you must follow, you will be assessed off of NIST 800-171 alpha or assessment. So what that is, that's 110 controls, but there's about three to five questions nested under each control. For example, you have 3.1.1, .1 .1, 
And that is about, that's a level one, that's the limit information access to authorized users, blah, 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 blah. And there's six questions nested under that. If you haven't answered yes to all six questions, then that control will be a no. Um, and that is at a level one. And that is scored of a, a five in the SPRS category or score that you know small businesses, if they wanna do business with a DOD, will have to submit their SPRS score. Um, so you have to make sure that you are certified against 800-171 alpha, you have CUI, controlled and classified information, or CTI, which is controlled technical information. And some examples of that is if you have engineer drawings or you, you know, uh, create engineer drawings for a specific DOD program. So you can either create CUI or you can be given CUI. Um, and they all should be labeled, but I know Nobody labels anything now, um, and the DOD is trying to change that. And at level two, you need a C3PAO certification. So you need to work with a C3PAO to get your assessors out there to actually do the certification. C3PAOs, who they are, can be found on the CMMC marketplace. If you just go there, you can see all the, the people that can help you out with that. Um, one thing to also notice is that in this 800171, just I want you to, to take a look at Appendix E, and I have a screenshot of that down there. Uh, nobody reads the appendices. I, I get it, I understand that, but that's where all these policies and procedures are located that you have to write. Because if you look at 800171, it doesn't talk about any, you need to have policies and procedures, but in Appendix E, it does. So if you look at the first one, security awareness and training policy and procedures, and you look at NFO, NFO stands for non-federal organization. So 800-171 assumes that you already have your policies and procedures. Um, that's, a, that's a really big assumption because I haven't seen anybody who has policies and procedures. Um, and that's where a lot of people are to get hung up on things and especially CMMC. All right, so I told you that CMMC 2.0 got rid of those 20 additional controls, which we call the Delta 20. However, there is rumors that NIST 800-171 Rev 3 will bring those 20 back. So just be prepared for it. They haven't done it yet. They might bring all 20 back. They might bring five back. They might bring 18 back. Um, the reason why they did it is because those 20 additional controls were actually really good cybersecurity con you know, requirements. It's just good cyber hygiene. You know, you have your DNS filtering. You know, everybody should have that. You have your sandboxing, your spam protection. You know, make sure your, your backups work. Um, and if you make code, make sure the code is secure. And, and procedures for handling CUI, like how are people supposed to handle it, you know, what are your employees supposed to do? How are they supposed to email it? That type of thing. Um, that's just really good things to do. Um, and a majority of them is in the audit logging in the incident response categories, but that's a lot of that as policies and procedures. All right, moving on. Um, one of the things that your customers are going to have on their contracts is this DFARS clause 252.204-7012. That is really important. And I don't think a lot of MSPs really know about it um, or have read it, but that's really important to CMMC. That establishes CMMC. And it also tells you that you need to report any incidents that happened um, on the network to the DOD. Um, there's a link in the DFARS clause um, that goes to this website, as you can see on the right-hand side. It says report a cyber incident. Now, you're supposed to report a, a cyber incident within 72 hours of knowing it happened. But the, the funny thing is, is that it takes a week to get even access to report a cyber incident. So you need to go ahead and start to register early because you know 72 hours is going to be too late because it takes so long. It might even take longer. Um, I don't know. It's a DoD website and they seem to never work very well. 
do not send any malicious software to your contracting officer. Um, I guess people have done that and I guess contracting officers have tried to open it. So that's one of the things that they said. I thought it was kind of funny because I know contracting officers and they would totally do something like that. So just be aware of that because um, your customers will probably assume that you already know this and you don't get a copy of the contract or anything and they just assume and it's not going to happen. And by the time they get certified, the assessors are going to come down and say, hey, you had an incident. Did you report this? And you say, uh, I didn't know I was supposed to. And that's not a really good answer because that's part of your incident response. So get on this website. Um, I have the link right there. Make sure you know about it. Okay, another thing that's really confusing to people is the FedRAMP requirements. It's not really talked about anywhere um, that I've seen in anything really official, but I just want to make you guys aware of it because I'm not sure that you're, you know about this. So this is specifically, I'm talking about this specifically for Microsoft. So Microsoft has the commercial version, GCC and GCC High. I know a lot of your customers are probably on the commercial version. Um, for CMMC, they have to be on GCC. They have to be on GCC. Um, and if they need to be ITARS compliant, um, ITARS is if they deal with any sort of weapon systems and your customers will know if they need to be ITARS, just ask them. They, they tend to know that they need to be ITARS. If they don't know, chances are that they don't need to be ITARS, but they need to be on GCC high. I just want to dispel the rumor um, because it seems like a lot of people think that if you have CUI, you need to be on GCC high. You don't have to have that. What you do have to have is going back, if you look at the previous slide, when you do submit an incident within 72 hours, you have to provide logs um, to prove, to show the DOD or packet captures. That's to prove it in GCC and GCC high. You don't, you don't need GCC high, just as long as you can provide the logs. Also, you need to be aware of if you have CUI stored in the cloud, it needs to be in a FedRAMP moderate or FedRAMP high environment. Um, or GovCloud is another thing that um, you just need to be aware of that and make sure that you select the right service for your customer. Now, Sox Otter, we store things in FedRAMP moderate by default and we can store in GovCloud, just let us know what we need to do. All right, next I'm going to talk about the, the assessment what the assessment is going to look like. The DOD expects assessments to start this year and really get going ramping up by next year. So you really need to get started on this or your customers really need to get serious on this if they, if they wanna do this. Um, and if you wanna do this and if you wanna help them because you could possibly be in scope of the assessment based on if you have access to their CUI. So just to let you know about that, you're not off the hook if you're an MSP and you have access to their CUI. Um, it's just a matter of scoping correctly. All right, so right now the DOD is saying and the CMMC AB is saying that you need four assessors. Now that doesn't make much sense if you have a company that has only four employees and you have four assessors come down and eh, it doesn't, that seems a bit overkill. Um, so they're probably going to reduce that to two people. Um, the great thing here about this is that the OSC, the OSC stands for the Organization Seeking Certification, will have the right to decline the lead assessor. That is terrific news because you might have some assessors who fail everybody. And guess what? They're going to go out of business because nobody's going to want to hire them. Who's going to want to hire to fail? Um, the people who are reasonable and fair and maybe a little bit easy, they're going to have businesses going to be booming for them. Um, and the lead assessor is the one who decides if the OSC passes or fails. Um, the lead assessors that I've spoken to, they seem to be very reasonable and up for conversation and debate because these regulations are written to be gray there is not a lot of black and white. So there will be times that you can debate with them um, based on the business and the business needs. Now, 
I think a lot of the assessors are going to be um, have a lot of experience at the enterprise level and not a lot of experience at the small business level. In fact, I, I spoke to one and he wasn't very confident or really knew how small businesses work. Um, so that's that's a that could be a good thing. You could you could teach them something there. Um, the estimated cost is going to be ten thousand to ninety thousand dollars. So it's going to be expensive, and you want to do it once and and be certified. So you need to take the time to make sure that you get them in, and you get that pass. As I said before, that poems are going to be allowed, um, but what I've heard from the DIBCAC is that you probably need to have at least an 80% on your SPRS score. You know, the top score is 110, which is a minimum score of their saying of 90. I know that's not like 80%, but that's what they're saying. So the SPRS score, you know, is weighted five, three, and one based on, you know, they think the uh, severity is for the control. So you could miss five questions at a level five, that's it, or yeah. Four questions, I'm sorry, four questions at a level five, I need to do my math. Um, or you can do 20 questions at, you know, the level one, at, or that's rated at level one. Um, the other thing is too, is it sounds like that for the assessments, the assessors are going to interview, test, and examine. Before they said they were gonna do two out of three, but it looks like they're going to do all three of them. So that's where your documentation has to be straight. Um, and the interview, whoever they interview, could be the MSP, the security officer knows what they're talking about and can direct them to the, the policies and procedures. That should be the right answer. It's just like, okay, how do you do that? And the interviewer should be, or the interviewee should say, let me look at my policies and my procedures and, and I'll read it to you. That's probably a good answer to do. NA is not gonna be acceptable. So it could be, you know, you don't use any VoIP phones. And the control is what, you know, how do you manage and monitor your VoIP phones? You say, well, I don't have a VoIP phone, so it's an A. Well, that's not going to be a good enough answer. What you really need to say is, I don't use VoIP phones. However, if I did, this is what I'll do and just regurgitate what right looks like for that control. And you need to pr prove that you did the control at least twice. I haven't seen anybody who's done a risk assessment. And you need to show that you've done it at least twice. So, and if you have to start getting um, assessed or certified within next year, that means you have to do it twice. And the risk assessment is not using rapid fire tools and saying that's a risk assessment. You have to look at NIST 800 30 to know how to conduct the, the right risk assessment. So, I know that's a lot on the slide, but I just want to give you some um, some examples of what to expect so you can um, talk to your end customer. All right, there are consequences to non-compliance. You don't receive the award um, because at the time of award, you must have your certification in hand and the compliance must be maintained throughout the length of the contract. So if, this, if it's a five-year contract, these certifications are good for three years, you have to recertify. You can't let it expire. Um, and there's, uh, there's a big thing going around about the False Claims Act. That's when private citizens can file suit if you're saying you're compliant and you're not, and, and they can go to the Justice Department or the Department of Justice and say, hey, these guys are lying. And they can receive a portions of the government's recovery. And you can see they claimed 2.2 billion last or in 2020. So that's you know some pretty serious stuff there. Okay, so I went through all the controls and I tried to, because one can, one technology can satisfy, you know, 20 or 30 controls. So what I did is I try to look at all the controls and what technologies, you know, the big ones that are going to satisfy most of these requirements. And this is what I came up with. So everything in green is what Sox Otter can help with. Um, the biggest problem I see a lot of our customers really having a hard time with is that FIPS 142 slash three encryption, because you need that on emails, you need that on VPN, you need that on backup. And um, 
I have a, a link at the end of this about how do you know if your technology has that encryption? A, ask the vendor um, and make sure that they provide that cert or cer certificate number. Um, and you have to also be aware that there is a sunset date. So that, that encryption is only good for about five years. So just be aware of that because not all the vendors in the space, in the MSP space, has paid you know, the $200,000 to go through this. Um, and you can take a look at, uh, at the CVMP to see which one has done it. Um, we do have uh, certificates for our EDR, so we can provide that for you. Um, and then we can provide, you know, to show you the, the GovCloud and the, the FedRAP monitor environment as well, because you'll need to have that for proof when you go and get your certification. Um, yeah, and the other stuff you already have, you already have the stuff in your toolkit, you already have these services, you just have to make sure that they're configured according to what CMMC requires. All right, so how do you get certified? You know, these are the steps that we recommend. So first, I've, I have done a lot of gap assessments and POAMs and written system security plans. That's just to get you started. So what I, how I define a gap assessment is I ask 3.1.1, limit information access to authorized users. I ask them that question, do you do it? And I ask them, you know, do you have a list? I need to get the list from HR. Does the list from HR match up with you have the last login from Active Directory? Do you have that? And they say, uh, mm, I have to double check that. So that's a no. Sometimes they say, you know, do you have, um, do you have VPN? Do you use multi-factor authentication when you VPN in? And that's a yes. I say, okay, great. I, you don't have to prove it to me. Um, so it's a yes or no. And that gets you started to the remediation plan, that plan of action and milestones. And in order to play in the, in the DOD, you have to submit your SPRS score into the PIE website, which I have a, um, a, a link at the end of this presentation about where you can find that, because you have to have your SPRS score. And when I do the gap assessments and POEMs, I also give the SPRS score as well. Then you go into the remediation phase, and that's where a lot of businesses kind, you know, kind of stop because this is a hard part. This is where you actually have to implement the technology and implement it correctly with the right configurations and then write about it. Um, and, and, and I think that's a lot of times it's the business that's not wanting to move forward, but the timeline is shrinking and it's shrinking fast. So really need to get on that and get focused on that. Once you have that done, the remediation and the policies and the procedures, what I recommend is you do a readiness review. Um, I recommend you bring a consultant in and have them test you for it so you're ready for certification. Um, I don't really recommend an RP, RP or, or a registered practitioner just because the training is only seven hours versus about 40 hours of CCP training. It really dig into the, the controls, whereas the RPs don't dig into the controls. They just do a high level of what CMMC and the CMMC AB does, unless they change the, the, um, the, the training program. Um, or somebody who's been around the block for a long time and really understands these controls and has dug into them and read all the NIST publications that support this, because um, it's thousands and thousands of pages of, of learning. And, and the lead assessors, they know they're not, well, they should know that they're not God's gift to CMMC because there's a whole lot to learn. But, um, you know, they're, they're open to debate. And where I see myself doing, I don't really see myself doing the, um, the assessments. I really see myself on the side of the OSCs, the organization seeking certification, because I think you need a voice. And I know MSPs are good. Um, you're good at what you do from a technical perspective but you just need somebody who really understands the controls and what they mean and how to interpret it for the small business. And I'm not sure a lot of MSPs, there are some that are really, really good. Um, some will need some help. And just to be able to talk with the, the assessors and debate with them and say, well, what about this? What about this? This is how I interpret it. And make them think a little bit, you know, because you're spending ten dollars to $90,000 to bring these people in. You know, you should have somebody on your side to make sure it's a, you know, one shot, one kill. Um, type of event because it's going to be 
a, a tough event. Um, and that's, that's what I have. I'm going to pass it over to Eric right now. So he's going to go ahead and talk about our services and how we can help you guys um, help you guys help your customers be compliant with the CMMC. So Eric. All right. Yeah. Melissa, stick around. We're going to just a bit of housekeeping. We're going to do a Q and a at the end. I know we've got a couple of questions already, already in the system here. If you have a question, just go into the, uh, the Q and a button at the bottom of your screen, ask your question. Uh, we've got Quinn and Melissa and myself here that will, uh, that will moderate that and we'll, and we'll try to get, uh, as many questions answered as we can. Uh, so just, yeah, just taking a look at our platform uh, here at Fox Otter. Obviously, we've built a platform to really complement uh, a, a lot of these, a lot of the controls and a lot of the, the initiatives uh, for CMMC, along with a number of other com uh, compliance concerns. Uh, for us, it's really about uh, giving you the, the capacity to identify threats and anomalous behavior, the ability to troubleshoot and respond quickly when these concerns arise, and, um, and then providing you with that focused subject matter expertise, uh, you know, calls like, and guidance, uh, you know, calls like the one that we're on now, uh, you can always reach out to our team. We've got several team members that are well-versed in not only CMMC, but a number of different compliance and regulatory concerns. From a platform perspective, uh, compliance is just one one end of what we're doing. We're also focused on the network with a uh, with a with a very competent SOC SIM platform uh, to ingest logs and review log data. Uh, not only using systems and algorithms, but also human analysis and human correlation. Uh, we've got our cloud monitoring platform where we've built out API integrations into uh, a number of the top tools that you're likely already deploying, whether that be 365 or Azure or AWS, Google Workspace. Uh, and then on the security side, as, uh, specific to the endpoint, uh, Sophos, Sentinel-1, CrowdStrike, Carbon Black, all now rolled into our platform so that we can analyze the data from all of these disparate points and then correlate it back to what we're seeing on the network side. And we pull that all the way over to the endpoint with our own agent, which will go out and do further detection response along with vulnerability detection and log retention and another of other services. We're going to give you access to our platform. Uh, a lot of what we've talked about today is not only having the right systems in place, but having the ability to to document it and provide that evidence. You know, if, they, if you if you, if you are having an audit or an assessment, uh, when, when those people come through the door, make sure that you've got the right information to be able to show them. And that starts with having our dashboard information, uh, where we where we're tracking things globally, along with our asset analysis capabilities where we're looking at every asset on the network, uh, we're, we're identifying these assets uh, a number of different ways, and we represent them a number of different ways in our system. So you'll be able to see a, a full map that will show you every asset that's connected on, on the network. Uh, then we can drill into that and look at things uh, by OS, by device type. We're able to investigate patterns uh, in those assets and then pinpoint details uh, of those uh, of the assets themselves and wh what the assets are doing, how they're communicating internal to external or external to internal. Another big piece of our platform is vulnerability management. Um, you know, I think if, if we look look at look at a lot of the requirements here, you may look at it and say, well, yes, we'll do quarterly scanning or we'll do monthly scanning. And as a, as a team, we're glad to help you with those initiatives, but. More and more, all of this is really pointing towards this concept of always on, always aware, right? So when we look at vulnerability management we'll, uh, across the network or the endpoint, we've got tools in place that will allow you to, uh, to, to manage and monitor vulnerabilities in real time, not waiting for the next month or the next quarter to get your scan. And then reporting. Again, evidence, right? So we've built out a reporting engine that allows you to dial in the dial in the tools that you have with us and, and, and get an output, whether that be on the you know on the fly, logging into our portal and creating a uh, a, co a comprehensive report, or scheduling that report to go out every month uh, or every week uh, to key individuals. 
and then and then pulling it back into compliance. So like I said earlier, not only are we dealing with CMMC, but a number of other challenges. So if you have uh, NIST 800-171 CMMC concerns, PCI concerns, uh, uh, New York DFS, FINRA, all these different concerns we're here to help, along with providing you with a suite of other services, whether that be pen testing or incident response capability, we're here to help you. Melissa's done a great job of putting together uh, a, a list of resources, and we're going to make this available to you guys. So don't, uh, I mean, you certainly can screenshot here, but uh, we'll, we'll, get you a, we'll get you a copy of these resources with the appropriate links so that you can click, click directly into them. A lot of those resources are what we use to put together the information now, and it's what we're using uh, ongoing to, to, to better understand what the requirements are. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to, uh, to questions. Uh, Melissa, I hope you're still here with us. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, providing... Uh, such information for us. I do have uh, a first question here uh, from Joe. Uh, Joe. Joe says, with so many changes uh, from the summer of 2020 to and then into 2021, it's difficult to understand what we need to do. Are there a couple of things we need to do now to get ready? I'll, I'll let you answer that one, Melissa. Yes, do your gap assessment first. Make sure you okay. do that. Make sure you do it according to 800 171 alpha and um that the hard part most msps do is just like okay well we there's all these tools out there that helps you do the assessment but you really need somebody to interpret the uh, the the questions for you like what does it mean how how do i how do i know what exactly it's saying and just put it in layman's terms and i always encourage the the business owner or somebody who's going to be the security officer or somebody who has you know clout in the business to be a part of that so they understand what is what is going to be needed and a you know and they're just going to be like cha ching cha ching cha ching because it's going to cost them some money um, so start with a gap assessment um, that'll tell you where you're at um, and uh, then you're going to be on your way. All right, we've got a couple other questions here in the chat uh, from Ming. Do you need an agent in order to do real-time uh, asset uh, asset management? Uh, no. So, the, so much of our asset management uh, is through our through our network scan. Uh, so we actually have a device that we go out on network, uh, pull all of the asset data, and then reflect that in our in our portal. Uh, we also have a question from Andre. Is this a tool? Uh, for MSP, MSP, MSSP, or for the end user internal team, both. So from a tool perspective, we'll give you access as an MSP. So if you are managing multiple clients with multiple concerns, you'll have a central place to go in and, 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 and manage them individually, as well as giving customer level or end user uh, IT level access as well. So if that uh, if, if you're doing co-manage or shared uh, responsibility there, uh, all all members can have the visibility that they need. Going back to the questions here. Um, rapid fire compliance manager, a good tool. Uh, so rapid fire has a compliance manager. Melissa, the question is, would that be a good tool for gap analysis? I'll, I'll, I'll answer a little bit of that. It's a start. It's a start. It's, it's a starting place, but I, it, it, is, it would be in no way able to do everything that's required, right? Yeah. So uh, if you want to start with some of that, date, that network data, you know, good on you. But, uh, but I think that there's a lot more to it that, uh, where you'd want to bring in a, a professional. Yeah, no, it doesn't knock off all the controls. There's a, there's a human aspect to CMMC. Um, there, there is no tool that can do everything. If, if somebody says that you can do everything with one tool, run away, run far, far away, because this is way too complex for somebody to be an expert or a vendor to be expert at all things. They, they should be niched. And that's, I think that's, that's what they want, what, you know, you need that defense in depth type of thing. And one vendor cannot be really good, good enough for CMMC for all, for all aspects, so. Okay, and, and we have we have another question about about um, uh, the services that we offer. So it says, is the detailed compliance review 
uh, offered by Fox are essentially the same as having a CMMC consultant review, or would you still recommend an external consultant? Um, you know, I think one of the things that Melissa just said about uh, as an organization where we see ourselves, it's really a, working on the side or the behalf of the OSC, right? The organization seeking certification. So, um, you know, so in that way, we're here to help. Uh, the efforts that we would do in terms of compliance review uh, would be would be designed to get you ready. Uh, for whatever the next step may be, or ready for that formal audit. And I've got um, one last, go ahead. I, I would like to, to add into that. Um, yes, sure. I would say it's a consultant review. Um, you could have another consultant come in after, or you could have you know, me go in first and then hire another uh, consultant afterwards, because we're going to see things differently, each assessor. I mean, I was in a my CCP class and I was talking about U.S. citizens and the lead assessor was like, oh, everybody, everything has to be located in the U.S. And I was like, wait, wait a second here. No, no, they don't. And uh, this was a lead assessor and everybody was like, no, you don't have to be in the U.S. So some people are going to have different ideas about different things. And it's just, like I said, it's a way to interpret it. Um, you know, you can, you know, check if you want to, if you want to do that, it's, it's really up to you. And if you get along with your consultant that you hire, because it's about relationship building. So do you trust them? If you don't have a warm and fuzzy, then get another person then. Yeah, and I'll tack on at the end of that, that this is a, you know, it's a, a marathon, not a sprint, right? This, is, this isn't a ready, set, go, done you know, scenario. It, it's typically, um, you know, there's, there are several steps that are involved. Um, as Melissa said, you, you need to do, uh, many times you need to have done something twice before you're even ready for that audit, right? So, um, you know, so we're, we're here to uh, help get you on the pathway. We've got a team put together uh, that will work with you, not only on the platform side and make sure you've got the right pieces in place, but also help you understand what the documentation, the policies and everything else uh, uh, needs to look like as well. One, one other thing I'd like to add is um, when I do these gap assessments, the average SPR score I come up with is usually a negative 50. Um, so they're 130 points away from passing. So that's pretty significant. That's a pretty significant gap. And, you know, you can't, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, doing your gap assessment, going through the remediation and writing the policies and procedures, and then going through a readiness review. I would like to, I, I would, I would think you would need to have some, you know, that person come back and say, hey, how are we at right now? Because when I do these gap assessments, um, they're pretty bad. You know, the, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of foundation that needs to be laid. Um, I wouldn't say they're pretty bad. It's just, they're good for small business, but not good enough for CMMC. So you have to lay down that foundation. Um, and then have them come back again because they'll be able to get into a lot more of the weeds once you do the remediation to make you better and then do the readiness review. Um, or, or meet, and I also recommend that you guys meet quarterly with your, you know, with your, your end customer to make sure that you all are on the same sheet of music. And the last question that has to do with uh, reviewing the Azure environment requirements again, we will make this, uh, we'll make the entire uh, recording available to you. So um, if you need to go back and look at any information or if you want to get back with us, but I think, yeah, the DFARS FedRAMP requirements uh, slide. Yep. And I don't know if there was a specific question about these requirements, but, but here's the slide you were asking for. All right. And uh, I, if there's no other questions, uh, I really want to thank everyone for, com for coming out. Melissa, is there anything you want to close with? Yeah, um, there's, there's no easy button for this. Um, it's, just, it's just not, it's not going to be an easy process. And one of the things that I talk to when I talk to end customers is that I really, I, I ask them, do you really want to do this? You know, I ask them, you know, how much is, government and how much is commercial you do business with. And if they say, well, I only do 10% government. And I'm like, well, you know, this is going to be hard and it's going to be really expensive. You need to figure out if you really want to do this or you want to, you know, do more DOD work. 
Um, same with the MSP, because you're going to be asked these questions too. You're going to be part of this whole thing. And you have to decide if you want to go through this as well, because some of the things that you implement or you do and help out is, is going to be hard as well and, and see if you want to deal with this or not. I mean, if you do, that's fantastic. That's, you know, you'll get a, a lot more business out of it. Um, and same with the end customer, but it's really a business decision if you want to go down this road. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot of um, end customers are probably going to say like, you know what, it's only 10% of my business. I don't want to pursue any more business with them because the DOD is a pain in the butt. I just don't want to do it. You know, that's, that's fine. But there could be another company who has 80% DOD work and wants that other 10%. So, you know, it could be a marketing ploy, you know, it's, it's a business decision and you guys have to make that decision. And, and, I, and I talk to end customers like that and they're like, yeah, or you increase your prices to accommodate this. You just got to see what, what's best for you and best for everybody. Melissa, thank you. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. I think, I think we all learned a lot. Um, guys, this is, this is the first uh, in a series that we're going to have a part two uh, coming up uh, likely next quarter. Uh, as we learn more information, we're glad to share that information with you guys. Uh, and we can all grow and learn together. If there's other questions, make sure you can make sure you email us. I think my email was, was there at the end there. Um, uh, Melissa, we bring that up. Uh, e, e Pinto or uh, at Sox Sauter. Uh, sales at Sox Otter, you certainly can get a hold of our team. And then from there, uh, we're glad to go one-on-one -on -one with you guys uh, through, uh, through any further Q&A. Uh, like I said earlier, we're going to make this recording available to you. So uh, we'll send out, uh, send out notice that the recording is available. You can click on, on the link and download the recording. So um, thank you guys for uh, spending the time with us this afternoon uh, and enjoy your day. Thank you, everybody.